Fredericton's first European settlement was a French fort, which was attacked and besieged by a fleet from New England. The story of this battle is kind of like the American myth of the Alamo. A small and beleaguered band of defenders is facing down a vastly larger and better equipped army of invaders. Except in this case, the invaders are coming up from what is now the United States. These invaders had a reputation for massacres, and losing the battle would likely mean death. However, just before the battle begins, the defenders' spirits are bolstered by a group of famous heroes of their time, who have come to aid the motley crew of defenders in their time of need. You're listening to Backyard History, the hidden stories that happened in your own backyard. The podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes with your host and author, Andrew McLean. At the end of the 1600s, the Maritimes were the French colony of Acadia. Acadia was sparsely populated by Europeans. Intendant de Moules' 1693 census indicated there were only 1,009 French settlers in the entire region that encompassed Nova Scotia, PEI, Cape Breton, and New Brunswick. In 1689, the French capital of Port Royal, which is now Annapolis Royal, fell to the French, and their governor was captured. A 35-year-old veteran soldier named Joseph Robineau de Villebon was appointed the new governor of Acadia. Although he had been educated in France and he had fought in European wars overseas, he had actually been born right here in Acadia. Villebon is a rather complicated character, to say the least. He was certainly energetic and a competent leader, both as an administrator and as a military leader, but he was also almost certainly deeply corrupt. Records of ample complaints against him by French settlers still survive today. Monsieur de Gargas accused him of having intimidated and insulted the French settlers and extorting exorbitant amounts of sums from them. Gargas called Villebon the terror of the country. In 1896, the intendant Bouchard de Champigny accused Villebon of threats and bad treatment of settlers and having secured for himself all trade in his fort. He was also accused of living a scandalous life, which is thought at the time to be referring to alcoholism and sexual philandering. Regardless, when he was appointed the new governor, Villebon's orders were to move Acadia's capital to Fort Gemesic. Gemesic is today Gemsag, and was then the site of an important French trading post. Long before Europeans ever arrived, it had been a key site for Mi'kmaq and Wulstaquay trading. Villebon decided that Gemesic was vulnerable to attack, and he decided to build a bigger fort downriver for a capital. The first ever comprehensive history of Fredericton was published by the St. John's Sun newspaper in 1893 to celebrate 200 years since the city's founding. It was written by a 22-year-old named William Godso McFarlane, and this series of newspaper articles totaled 94 pages long. In the summer of 1692, two centuries ago, Villebon landed at the point where Fredericton now stands. There he planted the gay standard of France and named it St. Anne's Point. He then crossed the river to the Nashwalk, or Nuijawak, and there proceeded to establish himself. Fredericton historian Austin Squires described the fort in his 1980 book, History of Fredericton, The Last 200 Years. In the winter of 1691-92, to soldiers cut logs for palisades, 600 of them, 18 inches thick and 16 feet long, and another 600 smaller 8-foot ones. The palisades were erected in March and April, despite a great freshet which flooded the site. A second stronger palisade was erected later. The fort measures about 200 feet square, had four bastions, and mounted eight cannons. Villebon named it Fort Saint-Joseph. The name didn't catch on, and it was known for the Wollastaquay word for the nearby stream, and it was called Fort Nashwalk. It had some varying spelling, though, including Naxuac, 
Naxuak, Nachuak, and Naxuat. Vilbon's orders were to ally with local indigenous groups and to encourage them to mount a petit guerre, which means guerrilla warfare, against the more populous New England colonies to the south. He befriended Willistaquay leader Sachim Taboos, who became his most important ally. The two even adopted each other as brothers. Perhaps unusually, because this isn't typically how things went back then. While Villebon was known for mistreating the French settlers, he also had a reputation for treating indigenous people fairly. In 1695, Villebon called a great council meeting of 14 chiefs at Fort Nashwalk, which had by then already become, according to historian Austin Squires, one of the chief centers from which the French and their allies launched raids on New England. The British had offered the chiefs more generous trade deals than the French. What proceeded at that great council meeting was a three-day-long event which, to be perfectly blunt, sounded distinctly less like conventional trade negotiations and more like a wild party. Acadian judge Mathieu de Goutin later accused Villebon of having cause to be used of 112 pounds of gunpowder and the bonfire to celebrate while drinking health to his mistresses and that he became drunk while doing so. All that alcohol may have loosened up the notoriously tight-fisted Villebon because he offered his Mi'kmaq and Wollastaquay allies considerably more generous trade deals than the British which cemented their loyalty to the French. Soon after, successful attacks were launched, ships were captured, and forts were destroyed all over New England. In the autumn of 1696, the New Englanders assembled a fleet of three ships and an army of 200 men. The fleet's renowned commanders, Colonel John Hawthorne and Captain Benjamin Church, who was the founder of what is now the U.S. Rangers, sailed up the St. John River to destroy Fort Nashwalk once and for all. The two commanders of the expedition to destroy what is now Fredericton are remarkable characters in and of themselves. John Hawthorne was the main judge and one of the leading forces behind the Salem Witch Trials. The Salem Witch Trials, by the way, had only happened the year before. When critics argued that the trials ought to include only real evidence, Hawthorne overruled them, arguing that spectral evidence that the accused were witches should be included. During the Salem Witch Trials, 200 people were accused, 50 were convicted, and 19 executed for witchcraft. The other commander of the invaders, Benjamin Church, was startlingly obese for the time weighing 250 pounds. Despite his famously large girth, he not only personally led his troops into battle, but is often credited today as being the inventor of what we call guerrilla war tactics. Although, in effect, he basically just copied the tactics that were being used by indigenous fighters at the time. The US Rangers today consider Benjamin Church the founder of their military unit. However, He has been accused of atrocities, including mass murder, of unarmed prisoners of war, torture, and a massacre of civilians right in Chignucto, which is located on the New Brunswick-Nova Scotia border today. That fleet, led by Hawthorne Church, had planned to sneak up the St. John River to what is now Fredericton and surprise the French defenders. However, the fleet was spotted by two Frenchmen sailing down the river, who fled back to Fort Nashwalk to raise the alarm. When he received the word of the approaching enemy fleet, Philbon immediately resolved to fight. He recalled all the nearby civilian settlers, and he told them that they would be armed for battle. The settlers quickly prepared for the fight, strengthening Fort Nashwalk's fortifications and arming 100 settlers. They would be fighting, and fighting alone. And, based on Benjamin Church's track record, if they were defeated, they would be murdered. But it turned out that they were not alone. In a scene straight out of a Hollywood epic, 
On the last day, before the enemy fleet arrived, a succession of allies showed up to help them in their time of need. And all of these people were the heroes of their day, some of the greatest celebrities of Acadia at the time. But Villebon's efforts at reaching out to indigenous people paid off in a big way when his adopted brother, Sachim Taboos, arrived, bringing with him 50 warriors who had rushed there from the Woolstekoy settlement of Akpak. Next, the Damour brothers arrived with a dozen other heavily armed and experienced French warriors from the north. René and Mathieu Damour had a reputation as some of the best frontiersmen of the time. The Damour brothers are generally accepted as the first European settlers on the St. John River. However, they're rather mysterious. It's not entirely clear when they arrived, or how they got there. They seem to have been there for quite a while before Villebon established his fort, and they completely adopted the way of life of the Woolastaque. Villebon, for his part, disliked how the Damour brothers lived and that he could not control them. He wrote, Although they have vast grants in the finest parts of the country, they have hardly a place to lodge in. They carry on no tillage, keep no cattle, but live with trading with the Indians and debauch among them, making large profits thereby, but injuring the public good. The Damour brothers' arrival to help defend Fort Nashwalk must have come as a surprise to Villebon who actually rather vehemently disliked them on a personal level. Just before that battle, he had written in a letter to France. I have no more reason to be satisfied with the Sieur d'Amour than I previously had. Their minds are wholly spoiled by long licentiousness and the manners they have acquired among the Indians, and they must be watched closely. Perhaps unsurprisingly, based on that quote, the Damour brothers would ultimately decide to fight alongside the Willistaque instead of the French settlers in the coming battle. Finally, one of the greatest French war heroes of the time appeared in their midst, the flamboyant and dramatic corsair, Captain Pierre Misonat de Baptiste, who was unquestionably one of the most successful pirates in Maritime's history. No wait, in all history. His name was alternately revered and feared all over Europe and North America alike. The swashbuckling pirate had an astonishingly successful career and a flair for the dramatic. While he was fantastic at capturing and destroying enemy ships, he also lost a fair number of his own ships. He was once even recalled back to France be personally scolded by the king for losing a brand new state-of-the-art warship that he had been given. At that specific moment, Captain Baptiste was once again shipless. He had yet again lost his ship in battle and only narrowly escaping with his life again. While it's not entirely clear where Captain Baptiste had come from before he popped up at the gates of Fort Nashwalk, it's likely that he had been attempting one of his periodic efforts to get out of the piracy business and to retire to a quiet life of farming. He had long ago bought up a large plot of land in what is now the south side of Fredericton, which, in his absence, ran a prosperous farm and brewery although he was actually only seldom there because he was always off pirating. Although it was not entirely clear how they knew one another, the Willis de Quay and the pirate captain were excited to see one another. Just like the Demur brothers, Captain Baptiste would ultimately decide to fight in the battle alongside the Willis de Quay rather than his own countrymen. According to W.O. Raymond in his book, The River St. John, the last preparations were now hurriedly made on the evening of the 17th. Villebon addressed the garrison with stirring words, bidding them to maintain the honor of their country and the reputation of French soldiers. This speech created great enthusiasm, and the cry of Vive le Roi awoke the forest echoes and was borne over the waters. Villebon ordered the garrison to pass the night under arms, 
From the barking of dogs, it was believed the enemy was drawing near. The dogs had been barking all night in the garrison defending what is now Fredericton, which drove home to its defenders that the enemy fleet was drawing closer. On the morning of October 18th, 1696, Father Simon was delivering mass to its defenders. He had been offered the option to flee ahead of the invaders' arrival, but he had stoically opted to stay behind in the fort. This is quite the courageous move on his part, as he and everyone else inside Fort Nashua knew that the invaders who would soon be upon them numbered more than double the beleaguered defenders. According to W.O. Raymond, Between 8 and 9 o'clock, whilst Father Simon was celebrating Mass in the chapel, a shallop filled with armed men rounded the point below, followed by two others. The alarm was at once given, and every man repaired to his post. William Godsell McFarlane wrote, The English landed at what is now called Barker's Point, on the opposite side of the Nashwalk, which is quite narrow at the mouth. Raymond explained that the French had allowed the enemy ships to land without a fight. Vilbon did not deem it prudent to oppose the landing, as to do so, his men would have to cross the Nashwalk River, and this would have been imprudent. This meant that the invaders were now landed where Fredericton's Billthorpe walking bridge stands today. The invaders lost no time in establishing and defending their position. W.O. Raymond wrote, The English took up a position on the south bank of the Nashwalk stream and threw up an earthwork upon which they placed two field guns from which they opened fire on the fort. A third gun of larger size was mounted soon after near the fort. The besiegers hoisted the royal standard of England and there were cheers and counter cheers on the part of the combatants. The two sets of cannons, one set from the French defending what is now Fredericton, and the other from the English from what is now Boston attacking, exchanged fire back and forth for the rest of the day and into the night. When darkness fell, the Woolstaquay, led by Sachem Taboos, would launch an attack, joined by the Damour brothers and the pirate captain Baptiste. Although one of the two leaders of the invasion, Benjamin Church, would later become successful for allegedly according to the Americans, inventing guerrilla war tactics, historians generally agree that he simply duplicated indigenous war tactics. Although he is still revered today by the American military as the so-called father of the U.S. Rangers, on that night, he was completely blindsided by the Willis-Dequay-led attack. Sachem Taboos' forces had crossed the Nashwalk to the north, and crept down the New English position under the cover of darkness and took them by surprise. When dawn broke, the battle was about a draw. Neither side had advanced at all. Yet, when we consider that Church's men outnumbered Tabusas by a ratio of four to one, it becomes clear that the Woolistaque had held their own against this man who was still revered by Americans as a master tactician today. During daylight, on the second day of the battle, both sides resumed sniping with cannons. During that day, though, the New Englanders' leaders bickered amongst themselves. The defenders got a boost that evening from the most Canadian thing one can imagine, a sudden and precipitous drop in temperature. It was, after all, mid-October, And while the French at Willis de Quay were prepared for the late autumn cold, the invaders were not. Not only had the New Englanders not prepared properly for the cold in terms of bringing proper clothing, more critically, they had not stored their gunpowder for the cannons and for their muskets in a way that could cope with all of this dampness. That night, as the temperature dropped further, The New Englanders tried to light bonfires to keep themselves from freezing and to keep their gunpowder dry. The French fort kept firing their big cannons at the New Englanders' bonfires and 
When the New Englanders lit small fires near the perimeter of their defense lines to simply try and keep warm in the cold night air, they soon discovered that the Wollastaquay were once again at their frontiers and armed with muskets. When dawn rose, the invaders still seemed to be in fine form, still firing the cannons at the fort throughout that day. Yet the French defenders had again upped them. At the behest of a young man who distinguished himself in battle, but yet who was otherwise completely forgotten to history, simply named De Cote, the French had secretly moved their heavy guns in the night to different locations to make it harder for the invaders to target them. William McFarlane wrote, They erected a demi-bastion and mounted three guns, but the French handled their artillery to better effect than the English. Night put an end to the engagement, and the colonists were prevented lighting fires when darkness closed down by musketry of the French. The English spent a cold and miserable night exposed to French gunfire. Things grew worse when a storm blew in, damaging the English cannons and getting their gunpowder wet. Over the course of this day of the siege, English casualties mounted, while their two leaders continued to quarrel with one another. That night, though, things were different. All over a much wider area than ever before, a series of large bonfires were lit, but soon after, went out. It was perplexing to the defenders. What were the invaders up to? When dawn broke, it became clear. That night they decamped, on account of dissension, it's believed, between the leaders, and the next day they were scurrying down the river. The fires all over what is now the north side of Fredericton had been a ruse. The New England invaders had set them to distract the French and the Wollastaquay, and in the meantime, they had fled. On their way back, as they fled back to New England, they burned every little farm they encountered on their way. They also took a black man they encountered while sailing down the river captive, bringing him back to New England to sell as a slave. According to W.O. Raymond, His name was Marblehead, and he was probably the first of his race within the borders of New Brunswick. In the end, the French lost only one soldier during the battle. René Damour had gotten sick during the battle from the cold and he passed away after the fight had been won. Meanwhile, the New Englanders lost eight soldiers in the battle and they left so quickly that they left the bodies on the shore of the Nashwalk. According to W. O. Raymond, they took another 12 wounded soldiers and five wounded officers back home with them. The New Englanders had been in such a rush to leave that they also left behind two ships. Captain Baptiste helped himself to these ships and once again resumed his life of piracy, soon using them to capture six more English vessels. That next year, peace was agreed upon by the English and the French. Now that the war was over, Fort Nashwalk was too isolated from trade, communications, and commerce to make a very good capital for Acadia. Furthermore, that spring, one of Fredericton's infamous floods heavily damaged the fort. Vilbon decided to move the fort to the mouth of the river, where he had built a new fort called Saint Jean, which is the site of the city of Saint John today. He died soon after in what is suspected to be a potentially alcohol-related death. The spring of 1701 brought one of the worst floods that was ever seen on the St. John River, sweeping away the remains of Fort Nashwalk, as well as most French farms and settlements in the region. Although apparently some of the fort's remains were still visible, though, for a long time after. Because in 1910, the historian W.O. Raymond wrote in his book, The St. John River, The greater portion of the site has been washed away, but traces of the ramparts were visible within the memory of those still living, and many cannonballs and such like relics have been found in the vicinity. In more recent years, though, a very different Battle of Fort Nashwalk was fought. For years, the historic site 
was the home of several large Irving oil tanks holding massive amounts of oil. When they were slated for decommissioning and dismantling in the 1980s, there were some proposals to develop the site. None of those proposals ever went anywhere. But then, in 2003, Fredericton's then MP Andy Scott announced that the federal government had, and this is his line, opened the piggy bank for a plan to rebuild Fort Nashwalk that was being touted as a major tourism development for the capital city. The proposal offered not only the completely rebuilt fort with on-site buildings, but also an amphitheater, gift shop trails, on-site interpretation center, but that most of the money would come from the federal government. The project hinged on the city of Fredericton acquiring the land from its current owners, Irving Oil. Unfortunately, the two sides failed to come into an agreement, and ultimately nothing came of the plans for what might have become an impressive and potentially lucrative tourist draw. And today, the historic site of Fort Nashwalk remains empty. That was Backyard History with your host, Andrew McLean. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard. The historians William McFarlane, W.O. Raymond, and Austin Squires, voiced by Josh Green. Produced by Jordan Lozier.